Welcome back to MCC International Webinar Series. We're now on our 8th episode. Again, this is brought to you by the Mabalakat City College, Office of the Vice President for External Affairs, and the Institute of Arts, Sciences, and Teacher Education. For this afternoon, our speaker's contribution to science, a star degradeologist or someone who studies star degrades, or water bears, is his discovery of new species of tardigrades. Tardigrade sparks the interest of scientists all over the world because of its extraordinary tolerance to various physical extremes in the dehydrated states that normally disallow the survival of most organisms. He is currently a Doctor of Philosophy student in Organismic and Evolutionary Biology at Harvard University. He is interested in combining modern and fossil data to understand the evolution of tardigrades and their ecdysozoan relatives. Prior to coming to Harvard, he became part of the Erasmus Mundus Master Program in Evolutionary Biology where he got two more Master of Science degrees from Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich, Germany and Uppsala University, Sweden. His Master of Science thesis involved the use of genomic and transcriptomic data for bioinformatic analysis, such as phylogenomics and ancient human DNA population genomic analysis. During this time, he was trained how to work in an ancient DNA lab facility. He obtained his Bachelor of Science and Master of Science in Molecular Biology and Biotechnology from the University of the Philippines, Diliman. Friends, let's all welcome our speaker for today's session, Mr. Mark Mapalo, as he talks about fantastic water bears and things about them. Hi everyone, I am Mark Mapalo, and thank you for coming into my talk entitled Fantastic Water Bears and Things About Them. First of all, I would like to give thanks to Mabalakat City College for inviting me in to be part in their um, webinar series. Hopefully by the end of this talk, um, you'll learn something new about tardigrades. So before I start my presentation, I would like to first share my tra academic trajectory. So I got my bachelor's and first MS in molecular biology and biotechnology from the University of the Philippines, Diliman. After which I went, I did a second master's uh, the Erasmus Mundus Master's Program in Evolutionary Biology, where I went to four different universities, namely University of Groningen in the Netherlands, LMU Munich in Germany, Harvard University in the US, and Uppsala University in Sweden. So since this master's program was double degree master's program, I ended up getting two more masters. One was MS Evolution, Ecology, and Systematics from LMU, and the other was MS Biology from Uppsala. And now I'm a PhD student in the Organismic and Evolutionary Biology program in Harvard. So my presentation will be divided into three main sections. First, I would like to introduce to you what tardigrades are, where they're normally found, and why do we study them. And second, I uh, would like to share what I did like in terms of tardigrade research and what I'm currently doing. And lastly, it's just a short segment uh, where I can where I'll say what can still be done um, in terms of the <clears throat> tardigrade research in the Philippines. So what are tardigrades? Uh, tardigrades are microscopic animals, they're invertebrates, and their uh, size varies from 200 micrometers to a millimeter. So their name came from the Latin words tardus gradus, which means slow stepper, and they're also called water bears or moss piglets. So this is a tardigrade. This is a typical tardigrade you will see in the internet. Uh, this is a video that I took. And here it's trying to find its food. So this is the tardigrade. And let's just skip to the part where it found its food. There you go. So this is the organism that I'll be talking about in my entire uh, talk. So this is a typical tardigrade uh, body plan. So it has five body segments. The most anterior part, which is labeled number one, is the head region. 
while the other four body segments each has um, a pair of legs that are normally terminated by with claws. So some tardigrades, most tardigrades have claws, but some also don't have claws. But claws are very important taxonomic characters for tardigrades. So where are they normally found? Uh, there are around 1,300 species of tardigrades. 1,100 are live terrestrial, while around 200 are aquatic or marine. <laughs> and so this map shows you uh, the global distribution of all marine tardigrades. And uh, as you can see, they're everywhere, right? In all major oceans of the world. And um, however, uh, as you might notice, there's only less than 200 um, marine tardigrades, mainly because it's actually hard to collect this type of uh, tardigrades because they're smaller compared to other tardigrades. And uh, it's hard to sample because you know they're, they're in a marine setting. Some of them can be collected like, yeah, um, so they're collected like in sediments and so on. But <clears throat> so that's why most of the discovered and described tardigrades are actually limno-terrestrial. So they are normally found in like terrestrial settings such as this. So <clears throat> they're normally found in mosses and that's hence the name uh, moss piglets. So such as this moss, mosses like on trees, on rocks, and sometimes like underneath um, water and yeah, so they, they're also found in, in lichens, liverworts, some are even like found in sponges. So um, as I've mentioned, most of the tardigrades that are described and um, yeah, uh, discovered are act uh, actually came from this terrestrial setting. However, I just want to point out that um, even though they are uh, found in a terrestrial environment, Tardigrades always need to be surrounded by water. So without water, they can't be active or they can't um, thrive. So that's why you normally found them in places like uh, when, yeah, when you normally found them in places that have like small pockets of water of them in them. That's why uh, moss is a good um, place where they can be found. So if you want to find some tardigrades, um, you can just grab a moss and there's a chance that you'll find a tardigrade there. And so as I've mentioned, even though they're in the they're, even though they're in a terrestrial environment, they still need to be surrounded by water. And that's why we normally call them limnoterrestrial, this type of um, tardigrades that are in the terrestrial setting, but then um, uh, need water to, to survive, us to thrive, they're called, we call them limnoterrestrial to be precise. So what are their relatives? Uh, I've heard people um, before saying that they're like worms or insects, but they're actually not. Um, tardigrades belong to their own phylum called the phylum tardigrada, uh, similar to how insects belong to phylum arthropoda and the humans belong to phylum chordata. So phylum tardigrada, uh, belongs to a bigger group of animals called the ichthyosoans. So ichthyosoans has ichthyosoa has like eight phyla uh, within it. So namely Priapulida, Cynorhynchia, Luricifera, which collectively are called the Scalidophorans. There's uh, the Nematoda, Nematomorpha, which are called the Nematoids. And lastly, there's the Tardigrada, Onychophora, and Arthropoda, which collectively are called the panarthropods. So I won't be surprised if people would only know about the phylum uh, nematoda and arthropoda because these are the ones that are normally um, available or like uh, in the uh, high, high school textbooks, right? And that's this also one of the reasons why the, why the other six phyla are sometimes referred as the neglected phyla because they're normally not being discussed and yeah, and uh, there's like fewer people studying them compared to the other two phyla. But nevertheless, nevertheless, they're still important. And I'm just gonna show you that the other neglected phyla of the ones. So here's the phylum priapulida. Here's the phylum nematomorpha. So this is the nematomorph. I'm the one actually holding the stick. And this is the phylum onychophora. So this Phylum is important because it's most, yeah, so it's often referred to as the sister group of arthropods. And their common name is called 
velvet worms. Uh, I guess it's because of their um, morphology. They look at how velvety their body is. So this is a, a live onychophoran. They're being cultured in this setting. And this is the first time I've actually seen uh, an onychophoran. So if someone find an onychophoran in the Philippines, I would say it's, it's, it would be very important or rather in groundbreaking at least for the onychophoran world because uh, there hasn't been no onychophoran in, found in, in that region of the world. And if there's a chance that an onychophoran can be found in the Philippines, it probably will be uh, in Palawan. And what's interesting about onychophorans is that they're actually the only phylum that are exclusively terrestrial. They don't have any marine um, relatives or marine, sorry, marine species. So as I've mentioned, um, tardigrades belong to the uh, ichthyosoans. So ichthyosoans are animals that undergo ichthyosis or molting. So we know crabs and insects molt so tardigrades also molt. So um, this is a tardigrade that is molting at the same time laying its egg. So normally tardigrades, when they, um, when uh, sorry, most um, some tardigrades when they lay their eggs, they molt at the same time and just leave the eggs inside their cuticle. But then this is not the only time that the tardigrade molt. You know, when they grow bigger, they need to um, have a bigger cuticle, so that's why they molt at the same time. And so this is the video after they, after the tardigrade just laid its egg. So as you can see, the eggs were left in the, in its old cuticle. So what, how do tardigrades, so what do they look like? So when you type tardigrades in the internet, um, I won't be surprised if you, the typical morphology of the tardigrade that you'll see is something like this. But tardigrades are actually, um, could be uh, morphologically diverse. Um, so tardigrades are divided into different groups. So for, for phylum tardigrada, uh, they're divided into two classes, uh, the hetero tardigrada and eutardigrada. And within the hetero tardigrada, it's divided into arthrotardigrada and the echinoscoidea. So these two orders um, uh, cons uh, is... Yeah, uh, they belong to um, class heterotardigrada. Well, the marine tardigrades are mostly in this order, the arthrotardigrada. And as you can see, they're very distinct to compare to this type of morphology. So um, yeah, uh, most of the diverse morphology of tardigrades could be found here in the arthrotardigrades. And personally, they're one of my favorites because you know, because of how they look like. And I've never seen one before, so it's one of my goal to actually see a live one. And uh, so in the order, sorry, in the class Eutardigrada, it's divided into, into two orders, the Aposhella and the Parashella. And so most of the limnoterrestrial tardigrades are actually in this group. And this is the group where I'm working, what where I've worked with, or at least what I'm working on. And uh, as you can see, the, 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 unfortunately, this group is not that morphologically diverse. That's why it's hard to actually identify the different species. And, and if you are not, you know, trained enough to <clears throat> to look what you should look for, um, yeah. And they're they're most um, they're also the ones that are mostly described and discovered mainly because they're the limited terrestrial ones and they're easier to obtain. And so just to give you an example of how um, morphology in tardigrades can be diverse, especially, uh, you know, especially in the arthrotardigrade, arthrotardigrada. So these are some of those arthrotardigrades. This is the Neostigarctus. This is the Actinarctus. You could see this wing-like structure. Um, I forgot what the name of the structure is. And this is the Tanarctus hirsutospinosus <coughs> with like, a very long cuticular extension. And this is one of my favorite tardigrades, the Tanarctus bulbulubus, uh, sorry, Tanarctus bulbulubus, where like um, there's a dorsal extension here that's, you know, that's like um, bulb-like. And the authors uh, suggest that these uh, structures are used for you know, buoyancy as well as for adhesion. So why are tardigrades fantastic? Um, you probably heard of uh, the news before that tardigrades 
um, were sent to space and you know survive uh, the space condition and other interesting um, stories of how tardigrades survive in different uh, extreme conditions. So they <clears throat> they do this by undergoing cryptobiosis. So this um, phenomenon is wherein like the metabolic processes of an animal, uh, in this case the tardigrade, actually slows down to uh, almost a standstill. And uh, at this phase, they're able to actually um, survive um, the extreme stress that is currently present in the environment where they're at. So for tardigrades, there are um, uh, uh, different forms of uh, cryptobiosis, such as cryobiosis, anhydrobiosis, and osmobiosis. Uh, but the most common form that they experience is anhydrobiosis, or the lack of water. Because uh, as I mentioned earlier, they need water to survive, and that's why they're called water bears, right? So, and uh, so they need water to thrive, uh, to be active. And so in the absence of water, they undergo cryptobiosis and turn into a shape that we call the ton shape. So this is a clearer a photo of how it looks like. So in, this is the active state of the tardigrade. And then when, they, when they're dehydrated, it becomes uh, a ton shape. And then once water is back, it just becomes, uh, you know, beca uh, it uh, becomes like active again. So I just want to emphasize that tardigrades need to be in the ton shape for them to um, actually survive uh, extreme conditions. So there are some research uh, that shows that some tardigrades might not need ton shape, but yeah, so in general, tardigrades need um, this form to survive the extreme conditions. So when they were sent to space, they were actually in this ton shape. Um, and then the, it's only when they were brought back to Earth, that's when they were rehydrated and the scientists uh, look and check if they survived the you know exposure to space vacuum and space uh, radiation and they did so yeah so <clears throat> if they were sent to space in an active form they will definitely die so all of those experiments that tests the tardigrades um resistance to stress all of them are in the ton formation so this is why they're fantastic it's because it, they could survive these kinds of um different stress but I also want to point out that tardigrades are not extremophiles because extremophiles could actually um, thrive and survive in the presence of extreme conditions. But tardigrades, they don't do that. They just like wait out um, until the um, ex until the stress is gone from the environment, right? So once the stress is gone, they just like become uh, active again and um, live their life. So yeah, so. <clears throat> A lot of researchers have been trying to um, elucidate the mechanism behind um, how tardigrades could actually uh, resist or survive these extreme extreme conditions, you know, while they're in the cryptobiotic state. And this is, I would say, uh, one of the reasons why they're fantastic. But for me, this is not the type of research that I've done or what, what I'm doing. It's because, as I mentioned earlier, they're one of those neglected phyla. So there's still a lot of things that can be you know, can be discovered about them. And that's also one of the reasons why they're fantastic because there's still a lot of unknown uh, things about them. And that's the type of research that I wanted to do, try to like um, hopefully uh, um, do uh, research and contribute more knowledge about tardigrades. And now I'm gonna shift to those type of researches that I've done with tardigrades. So the very first type of research that I've done was um, with Philippine tardigrades. So the first time I did, uh, the first time I did tardigrade research was when I was a bachelor student in the National Institute of Molecular Biology and Biotechnology. I was part of the immunology lab. So my PI, she just like revived uh, um, her previous um, tardigrade research. And at the time, we don't have any tardigrades to work with, so we had to collect, you know, Philippine tardigrades. And <laughs> at the time, there were actually only four um, tardigrades that were you know found in the Philippines and were, and were published in scientific journals. So all four of them were marine. So two were found in Palawan and two were found in Zamboanga. And as I mentioned earlier, um, marine tardigrades are really hard to collect. 
And aside from the fact that both of them are very far from Manila, where UP Diliman is. And so, <clears throat> so we had to find our own tardigrade since practice. And we have to find um, limno terrestrial so that it's, you know, it's easier for us. And luckily, there were actually, like, before I started this project, there were actually other undergrads who worked with, um, with the lab before and were successfully able to find other limno terrestrial tardigrades within the campus. So we know they exist in the campus. But then by the time that I already was starting this research, we don't have any tardigrades anymore. So we basically had to um, start from scratch. So I was with two other undergrad students at the time. So we found our own um, tardigrades and started culturing them. So this is how I cultured them. And I just want to present this to you in case some people are interested in doing this type of research. So first I found the moss, I soak it in water, and then uh, at the same time, I prepared um, uh, an agar plate, 2% uh, agar with KCM solution, and put some food in it and some water. And then once I found um, uh, tardigrades in this you know, petri dish, so I let it soak, as I've mentioned, for 24 hours, um, I transferred all the tardigrades in one agar plate. And then I um, checked this plate like <clears throat> all the time and see if there are pregnant tardigrades or tardigrades with eggs. And then um, I then isolate them and place them individually in a separate agar plate. So the idea behind this is that I wanted to make an isogenic culture wherein the culture, those tardigrades only came from one um, parent. And this would be useful in my succeeding um, analysis. You know? So when I, for my undergrad, I was able to successfully culture them. And this was the tardigrade that I uh, uh, cultured. And with the help of my Polish collaborators, we were actually able to identify this species as a new species. So by <clears throat> we did uh, integrative taxonomy, wherein we combined morphological analysis and molecular analysis. So for morphological analysis, we did a differential diagnosis of morphology between different species, as well as morphometrics. Well, for the molecular analysis, we did uh, DNA barcoding where we sequence um, four um, genes. So I named this new species after the Philippines, and that's why it's called the uh, Mesobiotus uh, philippinicus. After which I then discovered another new species called the Mesobiotus insanis. And then one of my students, Lowidin Itang, discovered a new um, species called Mesobiotus dilemanensis. So Lowidin is actually the student that I've taught tardigrade research where I passed down my everything that I know about tardigrades. So she's still working in the National Institute of Molecular Biology and Biotechnology. So if you want to like um, uh, do some tardigrade research in the Philippines, you could ask her or my PI in my previous my previous uh, principal investigator in, in UP Diliman. So here you could see that comparing all those three um, species, morphologically, they look the same. And this is what I pointed out earlier, how this group of tardigrades, they just mostly look the same. But when you look at the eggs, I hope you could appreciate that all of them looks different, right? So this is important because um, for some genus of tardigrades, for some genera of tardigrades, um, uh, they actually need the eggs to for us to um, identify them. Uh, to identify what species they are and if they're a new species. So uh, for the genus Mesobiotus, we, we often need the eggs. And aside from, you know, from molecular analysis, we also need this for morphological analysis. But nevertheless, we were able to see that, you know, they're new species because of this egg differences. Um, also, I want to point out that all these three species were actually just found in UP Diliman. So this tiny dot here in Manila. So but the Philippines is very big, you know, so there's a chance that we could find more tardigrades. So I will just, I will mention this again towards, you know, the end of my talk. And just to summarize, we have, uh, we were able to discover three new limno terrestrial tardigrade species from the Philippines. And as I mentioned, there's more to discover. <clears throat> so the second type of uh, research, uh, tardigrade research that I've done was uh, involving the tardigrade immune system. So we already know, as I've mentioned, that uh, tardigrades are uh, very good in um, surviving in different 
uh, abiotic stresses such as space vacuum, different types of different levels of temperature, but tardigrades are also living organisms, right? So they experience biotic stresses such as parasitism. So here you could see a protozoan like the Pexidium tardigradum <laughs> attaching to the tardigrades. And here's a fungi called the haptoglossa. It's just, it's growing inside the tardigrade. And I think this is the worst, like the, bala, the balocephala pediculata. Here you could see it started growing inside the body and then, uh, you know, as the as time progressed, it's just like grows outside from this poor tardigrade's body. So anyway, so obviously, as I mentioned, they do have parasites. And just a fun fact, there's actually at least four uh, parasitic tardigrades. So one of them is the tetrachentron synaptase. So this is the tardigrade, and it's an obligate parasite of the Holothurian or the sea cucumber Leptosynapta gallinae. So yeah. Uh, anyways, going back. Um, so as I mentioned, tardigrades have parasite. Uh, could you know they experience parasitism? They also have uh, microbiomes where in like on. Um, you know, they need the mechanism to actually fight this parasit parasites and to control their uh, their microbiome. So this made this led me this made me wonder then, like, what type of mechanisms do they use to um, to fight biotic stresses? So what what is their immune system? So this was the overarching question that I wanted to ask. So what is the tardigrade immune system? And so I started this type of, of research when I was still in in the Philippines, but was a chapter in my first MS. I only look uh, with one, uh, I only look at one tardigrade, but I actually expanded this more when I was already in my second master's, um, especially when I was in Harvard. So as I mentioned, um, the overarching question that I wanted to ask was, what is the tardigrade's immune system? However, that question is a research career on its own. You know, it can't be answered with just a set, with just one set of experiment. So, I had to ask like simpler, simpler questions, and hopefully, um, uh, that question, uh, yeah. So, hopefully, the and the results of that um, of my research would then be used for future uh, research in tardigrade immune system. So the question that I, so I simplified my question and then the question that I um, started to ask was, what are the uh, candidate genes for you know, tardigrade immune system? And as I mentioned, hopefully the results that I got would be useful for, you know, that can be used as a framework or foundation for future tardigrade immune system research. So how did I do this? Um, uh, during this time, there were actually um, no uh, references or no paper that um, talk about tardigrade immune system. So basically, I don't have, I have zero references at the time. And so what I did was this. Um, so as I mentioned, tardigrades are part of the ones. And luckily for us, two of the most common um, model organisms are actually part of this group. So one is the Drosophila melanogaster, which is an arthropod, and the other is the Cynorhabditis elegans, which is a nematode. So most of the um, immune system uh, of the most of the immune system of these two um, are actually uh, have been elucidated already. So most of the immune genes, rather, have been um, elucidated. So we know the what genes are involved in immunity in these two organisms. And so I use that to uh, an advantage because since uh, these two organisms are within so ones, um, there's a chance that the genes that are involved in, you know, the genes that are involved in immunity in these two organisms could also be involved in the immunity of it's closely related um, species such as, you know, tardigrades and other Tesosol ones. So that became the um, the start of uh, my research. So I tried to look for uh, homologs of uh, Drosophila immune genes and C. elegans immune genes in tardigrades and other Tesosol ones. So the immune genes that I um, look at are in this pathways. 
So first are the tall pathway and the IMD pathway. So they're both called the NF kappa B pathways because at the end of their signaling pathway, there's a translocation of this um, transcription factor we call dorsal diff in the tall and the IM, the relish in the IMD. So these two transcription factors are part of the superfamily called the NF kappa B superfamily. And just an offshoot from the IMD pathway is the JNK pathway here, which is also involved in immune response as well as some stress responses. For C. elegans, it's actually a very interesting animal because they don't have any NF kappa B. So NF kappa B, um, it, as I mentioned, is part of the tall and the IMD pathway in Drosophila here. And it's actually, NF kappa B is also important in, you know, in immune response in other animals. But for C. elegans, they don't have this um, protein. So they have a different um, immune system as, um, as Drosophila. So here, I, the, the immune system, um, this antibacterial immune system that they have is what I call the TIR1 pathway. So this is it. And so these are the different um, immune genes that I've, um, uh, so these are the different um, yeah, uh, pathways that I've used in my analysis. So I look for homologs of genes that are part of these pathways. So as I mentioned, they don't have NF kappa B for C elegans. So uh, I then use, uh, I then look for homologs of this uh, immune genes in eight tardigrades, two onychophorans, one nematomorph, and one priapolid. So I've used uh, transcriptomes for this analysis. And so my results are this. So a shaded box means that an hom a homolog is present in that organism. Say, for example, this one means that there's a, a spetzel homolog in Paramacrobiotus rich tersi, which is a tardigrade. So this is um, the tardigrade, the one with the yellow box. And I, uh, based on my result, um, most of the, um, we were not able to find uh, gene homologs of most of the tall pathway genes in tardigrades. And I just want to point out that we were also not able to find NF kappa B homologs in at least the dorsal part, the dorsal homologs in tardigrades. The same signal was actually observed with the IMD pathway. A lot of like, uh, we were not able to find um, gene homologs in tardigrades. Also, like, you know, same with the NF kappa B transcription factor. So this is almost similar now to like, you know, C elegans, where like we were not seeing any NF kappa B homologs. But for the JNK pathway, it's more conserved. Um, we see a lot of homologs. And I think it's because JNK, as I've mentioned, is also involved in stress response. So um, we, <clears throat> so since tardigrade is good at stress response, then it probably uh, you needs this pathway for that. And for um, C. elegans, it's also mostly conserved. And just to summarize, most of the D. melanogaster toll and IMD pathway genes homologs are absent in tra tardigrade transcriptomes. So I want to point out that these are transcriptomes and not genomes. So maybe, um, yeah, for that's why we need more um, genome sequences to actually confirm this analysis. However, two of the tardigrade transcriptomes that I use came from um, their predictions that come that came from. Uh, um, fully sequenced genome of tardigrades. So there's a chance that the um, signal, the absence that we're seeing is actually you know, biologically true. Um, next is the JNK and TIR pathways, mostly conserving tardigrades. And lastly, tardigrades appear to have no NF kappa B homologs. But yeah, all of this needs to be um, confirmed uh, via experiments. And I, um, I think that's the, and I would say that this is the next step for that. And yeah, but then uh, as I mentioned, I did this, you know, hoping that the result that I'll that will come out from this would be used as a starting point for doing tardigrade research in immune in the tardigrade immune system. And I think my previous lab in the Philippines is also still doing this type of research. So if you want to read more about this, um, uh, our results were published already, so you can check this paper out. So what I'm what am I currently doing? 
So I'm part, I'm, as I mentioned, I'm a PhD student in Harvard, and I'm part of the Ortega Hernandez lab for invertebrate paleobiology. So here I want to use fossils to study the evolution of tardigrades and their relatives, uh, their, like the so ones in particular, and hopefully um, to combine modern analysis um, to a study, the evolution of tardigrades. So you might wonder why am I in an invertebrate fossil lab if I'm like, you know, if I have a molecular biology background. It's because I was inspired when I was in Uppsala. I actually worked with ancient DNA uh, when I was there. So I extracted DNA from very old bones, like thousands, thousands of years uh, old of bones. And here I was able to appreciate the fact that ancient um, data you know, the ancient DNA stuff could, uh, could complement well with the data obtained using modern sample. And that's what I wanted to do. Uh, at least that's what I want to do for my dissertation. I want to um, combine the ancient data from fossils and modern data like genomics and developmental biology to understand the evolution of tardigrades. And since I've already, uh, since I already know uh, more about, you know, the modern analysis, I want to be trained more in the uh, acquisition of ancient data. And that's why I applied for an invertebrate fossil lab. So there are uh, now what I'm doing is I actually am working with tardigrade fossils. So um, even though they're very small, there are actually um, uh, tardigrade fossils available. So currently there are only two umber fossils of tardigrade. So these are like really real, true uh, tardigrades. And so far, as I mentioned, there's only <laughs> um, two of them. And the, fir the, the very first one the, to be described was what we call the Bayern Leggy. So it was described in 1964. And the fossil is actually, um, uh, lucky for me, the, the fossil was is actually like kept in the Harvard uh, Museum. So we have, we have it in our collection. So this is the fossil. And this is uh, what the tardigrade looks like under the stereo microscope. So it's actually um, uh, around the Cretaceous and it's around 80 million years ago. So so it's in the Cretaceous, so it's actually like during the age of dinosaurs. So this tardigrade was living contemporaneously with, you know, dinosaurs. And what I'm doing with this um, uh, fossil is that, um, yeah, I'm trying to re-describe it. It's because here, <laughs> this is the image that, um, that came with the 1964 paper. And as you could see, uh, at least for tardigridologists, this is actually like, um, not good imaging because we were not able to even show how the claws would look like. And well, it's understandable. It was 1964 back then, you know, when the, this was first published. And yeah, so because of this, uh, the author was not able to like uh, place this fossil um, in the tardigrade tree of life, or rather we were, he was not able to pinpoint um, what is the closest relative of this bear leggy, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, uh, what it's a, what is the closest living relative rather of this Bayer leggy but so what i'm doing now is i'm trying to like redescribe it so that i could hopefully like determine what its closest living relative is so unfortunately i still can't um share my data but hopefully it will be out soon and the other amber fossil is called it's also in the cretaceous and it's older around 90 million years ago it's called the melnitian swolensky and i'm just sharing this because of for this reason so here is a side-by-side -side comparison of a living tardigrade and the fossil tardigrade so without telling you which is the fossil and which is the living one i hope you could appreciate that morphologically they really look the same right so the box um images are the fossil and what's interesting about this is that um this fossil is 90 million years ago um 90 million years old and what happens is that uh, as I mentioned, the morphology looks the same. So it's like, it's a, so there's like morphological stasis that happened, like that lasted for 90 million years ago. And for me, this is very interesting is because why did they kept this morphology? What's so interesting about this morphology? And yeah, so it's just like, so you would expect then that, you know, tardigrades are that around this uh, time, that around this age would probably would also look similar to a living tardigrade. So, but then again, 
even though they're morphologically the same, physiologically, they might be different, right? But we won't be able to know that in the fossil because it's already a fossil. So to summarize, I'm trying to redescribe the urine leggy, and hopefully there's more update to come, and especially the de developmental biology portion of my um, study. Yeah, and I'm trying to delve into the evolutionary developmental biology, which is also called the Evo Devo. So yeah, um, I'm still in my second year of my PhD, so there's more things to, um, to do. And for the last section, I just want to say what can still be done in terms of tardigrade research in the Philippines. So as I've mentioned, there's only, yeah, all the three new species were found in Manila, right? So there's 7,641 islands in the Philippines and the Philippines is known to have high endemism. So there's a chance, there's a high chance rather that the tardigrades that you find in other islands are, or other parts of Luzon actually could also be a new species. So Hopefully one of the audiences here would be inspired to actually do tardigrade research and find new species so that we could increase the number of um, tardigrades, uh, in the, 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 the number of Philippine tardigrades, you know, and increase the, the, the known diversity of these animals. So to do that, uh, I just want to share to you how I normally collect uh, tardigrades. So first, so this was taught to me by my Polish collaborators as well. So first, um, you just soak the moss in a 250 ml beaker for 24 hours. Then you transfer the water to a grad graduated cylinder and you wait for like, you know, uh, sorry, you, do have, you, you, sh you should not include the moss. And then you wait for 30 minutes and for the sediments to settle down. So the idea is that the tardigrade would settle down with the sediment and discard the water and leave around 40 ml of that and refrain from too much agitation so that you won't, you know, discard the sediments as well and the tardigrades. And then you slowly, and then you transfer approximately 10 ml to a petri dish, you know, a small 60 millimeter petri dish, and then just you look for tardigrades under a stereo microscope. You know, you do it in batches so that it's easier. And then once you find a tardigrade, you can culture them and do DNA and RNA extraction, or you can also do slide preparation. And so you could also do slide preparation after culturing so yeah, the idea is you have to have all this data for the integrative taxonomy for both morphological analysis and molecular analysis. And with that, I would like to conclude and say that there are more tardigrades that needs to be, you know, uh, more tardigrades needs to be found in the Philippines and more tardigrades to research on and more tardigrade research to, to come. And I really like this clip from Cosmos, you know, just tardigrade being, and you know, being awesome as it is. And lastly, I would like to share the tardigrade song that I've actually made. And so I, I, I animated and sang this myself. So hopefully I, you, you'll appreciate it. So microscopic yet so strong Eight-legged creatures with claws and mouth To their own phylum they belong They look like bears in the water Some people call them water bears These soften moss dwelling fellows Have a secret I will tell That they don't die they won't die, they're tardy grades, they don't die, they don't die, they won't die, they're tardy grades, they don't die, temperature high and low, space back in yes or no, they won't die, they're tardy grades, they don't die. Yeah, so that's just an excerpt, and if you want to uh, watch the whole film, um, you can just I have I have uploaded it in I've uploaded it in YouTube. So um, and watch the if you want to watch the entire movie, just go there. And there's an important disclaimer at the end, so you should watch it. And so to end, I would like to acknowledge all these people who actually helped me and trained me to do tardigrade research. Without them, I would not have done this type of researches.
Um, yeah, so if you want to contact me, this is my email. And thank you for listening to my talk. I hope you learned something new today about tardigrades. And some, hopefully someone would be inspired to do tardigrade research as well in the future. Thank you. And on behalf of the college president, Ms. Michelle Aguilar Ong, and the vice president for external affairs, Mr. Raymond John D. Vergara, we would like to thank our speaker for this afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Mark Mapalo. For the final part of our webinar episode for today, we ask our participants to please answer the online evaluation and feedback form within today, November 21, to receive your e-certificates. The form will be closed at 12 midnight of November 22. Again, we thank everyone for their usual support. See you again next time.